Yeah. You know, it's kind of interesting because a lot of people that, you know, become scientists always loved it since they were a child. And I, you know, I had an interest, but it's not like I was like, oh my God, go look at the stars as like a small child or something. Like I don't have memories like that. I just remember always being curious. But I think the thing that it really got me when I started um, at community college was my professor, Professor Shaw, was, um, you know, talking to us in this class. It was a really small class. I think there were less than 10 students because there's not many students at community college that, you know, decide to take physics. And he was just like super casual and he was talking about magnetic monopoles. And it's like, you know, very esoteric thing in physics. But the idea is, you know, every magnet has a north and south pole. If you cut it in half, it still has a north and south pole. And so what he was describing to us is how physicists had predicted the existence of an isolated north or south pole, what's called a monopole rather than a dipole, and the fact that scientists were going out to look for them in the universe. And this idea like really deeply perplexed me that the human mind could come up with this idea of something that might be physically real and not know if it's real or if it's a real description of nature and then go out and look for it. And I just fell in love with that. So it's in some sense like the idea that our minds are capable of comprehending reality, but not just comprehending it. We can actually test our comprehension and and that for me gave me such an anchor and a security in like all this sort of... Uh, I don't know, curiosity I had and lack of structure in my curiosity that I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Like up to that point in my life, I think I had really thought I was going to be an artist. And I just thought that the rigor of like what science provides and the constrained creativity that these things have to be like correspond to the way the world works. I just absolutely love that idea. No, there was an intermediate step, obviously, because I had to go and get my four-year degree before graduate school. So I ended up going to Florida Tech um, in Melbourne, Florida. And I also had a really good experience there uh, for the most part. I had a, a great professor um, who, you know, had me join his particle physics group. I really wanted to do theory and he did experiments, but it was a, a chance to do actual research. Um, and I think, you know, every every physics course I took just solidified my interest in in doing physics professionally. And so I really knew, you know, from the time I was 18 and took my first physics class that I wanted to be a professor of theoretical physics and study the deepest ideas in the universe. I was just like, this is what I'm doing. I don't know. Yeah. So I, um, it's really kind of my PhD advisor's fault. <laughs> so I did my, um, my graduate degree with, uh, Marcelo Gleiser as my PhD advisor. Um, and he's, uh, you know, most of his career, he's been an early universe cosmologist, but around the time I was working with him, he got really excited about astrobiology and in particular the origin of life. And he was looking for a student to work on a particular problem related to the origin of life. And so he was trying to get me excited about that problem and also about astrobiology generally. So I like, I, I very vividly remember him, you know, trying to recruit me to work on this problem. And I was very adamant that like, you know, my serious stuff was like the cosmology stuff because that's what real physicists do. And I was just doing this other stuff to learn skills and like think about a fun problem. But the more I read of the origin of life literature, the more I was like, no one in this field really knows what the origin of life is. There's like, there's no consensus. There's no conceptual framework. There's no paradigm. There's no theory. And, you know, as somebody that came into theoretical physics thinking, isn't it amazing that the human mind can come up with these kinds of very deep descriptions of nature? I just thought, wow, like uh, all of like my heroes of previous generations confronted these really unknown problems. Like that's the kind of problem I want to work on. And so I really got hooked on the origin of life because no one knew the answer. Um, and so that's why I, I kind of pivoted during my PhD to being really serious about this problem that initially you know, I was just doing because Marcelo asked me to. Um, and I'm really grateful uh, to Marcelo's mentorship, um, you know, getting me excited about these kind of problems. So uh, that was, you know, a major transformation. So by the time I was finishing my PhD, I knew, like, I really knew I wanted to work on the origin of life and really understand what the transition from non-life to life was. And I had some ideas about what kinds of things I thought might be relevant um, but that's pretty pretty much cascaded into my whole career and the problem that I'm really obsessed with and like think about all the time. Um, I think math is the final stages of physics, actually. So usually people think math, you know, all physics is math because that's when, when you enter an undergrad course, you're taught what physicists have invented in previous centuries. So you're taught the mathematical formalisms they came up with, but you're not really taught the process of coming up with those kind of theories. And it, and to me, that's what physics is. Physics is the process of looking at patterns in the world and trying to come up with 
universal, very deep, abstract explanations for them. And and they have to be deep and abstract to actually be universal because if you want to describe a huge number of things in the world uh, with a single description, you know, it has to, it, it, in some sense, like that necessitates that it's an abstract property that you're looking at. And and you can see this across, you know, all of the theories of physics we have so far. So I like to give examples like, you know, mass seems very physical to us now, but it's a concept that was invented over many generations of humans trying to figure out how to measure motion and what would be the relevant variables. And, you know, by coming up with mass and actually being able to invent clocks that had precision to measure things on seconds, time scales, we were able to come up with laws of motion and laws of gravitation. And then we realized that motions in the heavens were the same as motions on the earth, right? And so that's a very abstract idea to think that gravity is controlling, you know, why we're both sitting in our chair right now <laughs> um, having this conversation. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it controls the, the the gravitational part of it. Um so I was really, I, I think what is underappreciated about the art of doing physics, and I really do think of this part as an art, so I don't think I've really lost that sort of creative artistic part of myself, is trying to look at the world and trying to understand something we don't about it that's rather deep um, and abstract. And once you understand the concepts and you know how to ask the question, then you can formalize it into the mathematical framework that is something that you can share with other people and becomes the standard way we talk about that phenomena. And so, you know, I guess the the short punchline version of it is I don't think phys physics is what's studied in physics departments. I think physics is a process of coming up with these kind of abstract laws of nature. Um, well, I think there there's a couple things uh, going on with what you described. One is we haven't done what we we've done in physics, where exactly as you're describing, because we understand something about laws on Earth, we can extrapolate to other places in the universe and have high confidence that we're talking about these phenomena accurately because they they match observations. So right now, as it stands, we can talk pretty well, reasonably well about life on Earth. We don't understand the origin of life. Um, but once you have cellular life and a cellular architecture, we know a lot about the kind of processes that have happened. Obviously, there are open places where it's still really challenging, like in you know embryo development or when you get a diversity of body plans emerging all at once, like these kind of really rapid complexification events are still very perplexing. And I think actually some of the mechanisms of those are related to what happens at the origin of life. Um, because my view right now is like the origin of life is a continuous process on earth. It's not just, it just happened in the past. There's like the origin that started the cascade of it all, but there's origins happening all the time. Um, but uh, when you try to take that process and you say, what would that look like on another planet? We have no rules, no laws that would allow us to start from planetary geochemistry and say anything meaningful about what alien biochemistry would look like or what alien technology would look like. Um, and so we are really still in early stages of being able to take things that we've observed on Earth and extrapolate them in the way that you're describing that we've done for cosmology or astrophysics or planetary science. Well, um, my stance, you know, and I'll, I'll get on my soapbox, but, you know, I, I, I also understand I could be wrong, is um, that I, I really think there's something missing. It's like, where do the laws of physics come from? Why is the initial state of the universe as it is? This is like why we get things like the multiverse and, and you know, solutions like that that are trying to fix these kind of problems. Um, but I think, you know, when I look at the phenomena of life, what I really ideally want is something that tells me the mechanism when a chemical system actually builds into the world of complex biological objects. Like, how is it that you get evolution before you have an evolutionary architecture? Um, and, you know, the laws of physics don't have really a sense of evolution. They're not incompatible with, like, the theories of evolution we have with Darwin's theory, like they, they can sit on top of each other. But if you try to directly connect one, them to like take the laws of physics and build into like this kind of, you know, like Newtonian physics predicts the way the universe behaves for all time, just as a principle, you have an initial condition, a dynamical law, you know, everything for all time. Uh, and, you know, uh, evolutionary theory says you have endless forms you know, being created as a function of time and constant novelty and selection on that novelty. I mean, just describing what those 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 two paradigms talk about, like it's very clear that there's some kind of dichotomy there. 
And a, a, a lot of people have argued that it's just an emergent property and like they, they should stick together. But if you try to stick them together in a natural way to solve the origin of life, they just, they just don't fit together. There's some, there's some gap. And that gap, I think, is the laws of physics that we don't understand that are actually underlying life and allow you to connect the way that we think the non-living universe behaves and the way the u- living universe behaves. Because obviously they occupy the same universe um, and they should obey the same laws. Um, so in some sense, I guess part of the paradigm that I'm, you know, trying to work on is like how do you unify the inanimate and, and, and animate to talk about the transition between the two? 